So what we'll do is we'll take a look first at the speech three, and it's called a more persuasive message. This is based on the two theorists, Richard, as well as Perlman and Albert Stachekas concepts. So this speech is three to four minutes in length. Uh, your job will be one of a consultant. So think about you as a consultant. You've been hired as an expert in these two different types of theoretical discourse, if you will. And you are going to pretend that a marketing company has come to you and asked you to help them tailor a message more effectively for a college audience and for a college student. So your job is to present a rhetorical text to us and suggest how this needs a theoretical approach to suggest a better way to create clear meaning. Since both uh, I. Richards and Perlman are working to create a, a, a more perfect message, if you will, uh, and a more persuasive message. We can apply different elements of both of their concepts to any type of artifact and suggest some ways to make it more effective towards their targeted audience based upon what we review in class. You would talk to us, your audience, as if you are we are those people. So let's say you find a Nike ad that you wanted to use, you would talk to us like, hello, Nike executives. Does that make sense? And so you could start to talk in those terms. So this speech will require you to use one of the two theorists now that we that we were that we've been studying. We'll take one of the theories or concepts or a couple different premises from the same theorist and give us a pitch as to how the artifact or how you can make the artifact more persuasive to college students. So there's a couple steps that you go through. First you'll find a rhetorical artifact. You all know how to find an artifact right now? Make sure it's persuasive. Huh? Okay, good. Then you make sure that the artifact is not effective in its appeal to college students. To do so would become incredibly redundant. And then you're going to examine and explain why it's not effective in its communication towards college students. So what about it is problematic? Those problem areas are going to be the ones that you will address. So tell us then how your theorist approach will make it more effective and how you would suggest it be achieved. Uh, like all speeches, so you need to create a thesis, one that persuasively urges the audience to apply a theory in order to make the artifact more effective. So it could be something like, to encourage your company to consider making changes to appeal to a college student, I suggest using the theorist um, Heim Perlman and his theory of starting points of presumption, presence, and the audience of one. You can use between two to three main points for this speech. So if you simply wanted to go that route, if you wanted to interchange, I suggest that we use the uh, that you have a good understanding uh, um, let's say that you should use only like you can use one part of Weaver one part of Perlman if you want to you can also combine those two um, so that's essentially what we do and then the prompt is laying out it's on that little second page there if you would like the format that is essentially how you could set up and justify. So each main point, if you see, it'll be like identify the symbol that's problematic. So is that a word? Is that the concept? Is that the value? Is the way that they've organized the argument? Is it that they've had an assumption about the audience's values that no longer exists? Whatever you want to talk about. And then you'll suggest why that current symbolization won't work as effectively. So it essentially, you know, Perlman and uh, Richards both are trying to lay out to you why like how meaning is really important or why taking the audience into consideration is important. So what about the current symbolization isn't working? What about it would it be the most effective way to go around? And you could give me some support that suggests that that's what they say or that's why it's not effective or that's how it's probably working against you because they're trying to work to create meaning. And then you would relay what your theorist suggests, the how and the why for making the rhetoric more effective. So if we took this word out instead and applied this word, now we know that this word has one concrete meaning. It's something you think it's referred to, right? So you can just go around and explain to how that would be more effective. And um, yeah, that's really about it. Yeah. You, you gotta do three main points. Same structure, lay out a claim, provide us with some evidence, suggest back to your central idea of how this could become more effective according to your theorist. What do you think? Yes, okay, fine. 
love it, but they can't see it. Mm -hmm. So, so why don't we do this? Who wants to do the paper? Can you go ahead and bring us paper? Uh, yes, Krista. Who'd like to do the speech? Come on in and bring the speech. How many pages does it have to be, Amanda? I don't care. Let's get the job done. How many? How, hold on for a second. How many? Um, uh, what format? You can write it in APA format, so you don't need a title page. So if you cite anything, simply make sure that your works or your bibliography, sorry, is reflected as proper APA citation as well as your in-text citations. Does that make sense to y'all? Uh, and that just APA format, like, but you don't need the title page. Like this isn't a research paper. It's simply like some, your name, my name, etc. And then, uh, yeah. So there's no paper qualifications. Simply attach a photograph or a screenshot of the image. The, the artifact in this case, I would prefer it simply to be a an advertisement or just like something that's tangible rather than having a link. But if you're really committed to something and you're like, oh my gosh, I this part is so great, that's fine. Simply put the link on um, your paper and I'll go through it. Okay, yes. So just to clarify, that paper is essentially the speech, just a quick option. Yes, but now it's going to take a different formalized style of writing, right? right? So there won't be any I or me, or we. Okay. So like, uh, or, well, I suppose it would be the third person, but uh, instead you could write again to that particular audience and simply take it as if it's a written proposal rather than something that you would speak. So let's see the difference between the two. But that doesn't mean that you need to get fancy with language or anything. But thank you, Krista. Yes? Did you use each of these criteria? This criteria and that you didn't use any period. That's all I want to see. I don't care if you smoke your ums and ahs. Like, that's not my huge problem anymore. You know it's a problem and you know how to fix it. I simply want to see that you can talk about each one. So could we bring, like, the card cards? Oh yeah, you can always bring like one piece of paper front and back. That's what you're always allowed to have. And then if not, remember you can always have note cards, one for each paragraph. So the intro, body one, body two, body three, so you can keep it. And then the conclusion. So essentially five note cards if you'd like. Bella, did you have one? Yes. Three to four minutes right here at the top. Go ahead. Yeah. That's what I was saying. You can. You do the first person, I suppose. It's fine. I would. You can. It's simply don't write it like I'm right here. Yeah. Does that make sense? So you can take it from your own as an expert. Like if you were writing to this company and you had like to submit your proposal. absolutely like a formal proposal or something. Like something you could go through. Absolutely something like that. Like. So if we have somebody great, if you want to help me, and then maybe we could do a little bit of a like review or go over another theory or something. I don't know. If you have a sense. Okay, good. Good. Any other questions about that? Does everybody have an idea? No, and that's okay. You may need to take some time, and it, it shouldn't take you forever. It's simply a way to have fun and apply the material the mic. It's a simply a way to have fun and apply the material in, in a unique area for different clients. That's why I'm doing it in this case. So we're going to build upon our idea of Perlman today. And I wanted you all to think about in advance if you want to pull out some of your questions or any that you did for this theorist um, and any of the questions that you really wanted to focus in on or narrow in on that you had questions about that wasn't very clear. I find that Perlman is one of the most difficult people to understand. I think, that, well, his writing is dynamic to begin with and, and that makes it rather difficult. But this idea of an audience also is a bit difficult. And the same thing goes for Richards. And when I said, I remember a long time ago, like, try to pretend like this is the time period we exist in. If we look outside of that time period, it gets a 
awkward sometimes. You're like, why would anybody not know that? Why would you not just call that audience analysis? Oh, it's the same thing that we've been talking about. It's just in different contexts and different times and those ideals that we already know to put into play to speech now didn't exist back then. So that's sometimes why it seems so confusing, but when I, it comes down to the explanation, it gets pretty easy. So for anybody outstanding, um, feel free to sporadically do a, a hand raise or a question. But I recast out the, I need that little handout for y'all. And then I recast out the two speeches that we had in here before, just in case none of you brought them with you today. Do you see it's the gun one? The starting points of the preferable. Because it's it'll like, draw in a certain audience. Okay, it may draw in a certain audience. That's for darn sure. Yes. Because if they're speaking for a group of three women in the pregnancy, you know, it's going to be more specific. 
Okay, good, good. All right. Looks like the purple may need some expansion. Yeah. It's something called a v, v, and it ends in an L U, and it's called a. Now, abortion in essence is not a value. It's a word, right? It means one thing, but there's a whole gamut of values all attached to that specific word. And we'll talk about how that affects an argument greatly. And why our friend Perlman put that into play. So, I think the best thing we're going to do will be to start with our concepts of audience. Last time you understood that Hein Perlman brought up this idea of a new rhetoric because why? <coughs> he wanted to do what? What were some ideas that he had about what was going on in the world? He lived during World War, and he was like, how are people rationalizing with logic to drop a bomb and kill people? That's crazy town. We need something else to go on here because rhetoric is becoming incredibly pervasive. People are using language, if anything, only language to do what? To create hate, to create an idea that we should just go out and take out masses of people, right? And all through that process of, of rhetoric and communication. So he's seeing the effectiveness of communication, much like that of Weaver. But he's suggesting that, in turn, we need to start to use rhetoric for what purpose? Yes. Okay, so for rationality, and, but how to also argue about issues that aren't necessarily always rational. For example, I am not a fighter. I don't fight. I would never fight. I never fought anybody. It's so scary. But if somebody came at me and I had Dylan or something, I maybe would need to fight because I love so much. So, in that instance, what does he start to suggest? So, rationality. Oftentimes, we're not rational when it comes to matters of the heart or our emotions, or in this case, my values. I would not fight in certain cases, but I may fight in other cases. Does that make sense? Do, do all of you maybe fall into this same idea? I don't even know why I chose fighting, but it's like if I had to, and this goes back to that hierarchy that maybe he was talking about, if that makes any sense. But the idea is, it's like in rationality, how can we even argue about matters of the heart, matters of the mind, issues that deal with particular values? Because it needs to be done well, it needs to be done ethically, and it needs to be done mindfully. But he was also very entranced by this idea of rhetoric as well, because why wouldn't you be? You see how one individual can persuade an entire group of people using only language and using words. But the idea also that Perlman is so effective with is that his theory and his th concept, the purpose of using this idea of a universal audience that he speaks about is to reach the most people possible in the most ethical of ways. Does that make sense? Okay. So the most ethical possible in the most ethical of ways. So we can accomplish great goals, we can do great things. We just need to make sure that we put in some um, elements of ethics and we start to learn how to rationally uh, reason with things based upon value. Because a syllogism isn't going to deduce that something is right, or something is good, or something is wrong. You can't argue values through a syllogism. And so he's like, there has to be another couple different ways to do that. So the idea that he puts forth is that the main important factor that people are missing out on, or they're not paying enough attention to, is that concept of the audience. And his audience is his first major theory that we will look at. It builds on a lot of ideas of Aristotle's, and it's a real re-examination of a, uh, uh, the epideictic speech. Does anybody remember what this type of speech is? If you recall it from the day or more than it. Thank you. 
Okay, good. Absolutely. Um, it's where our audience is also going to evaluate our speech. So it's usually a value speech in that sense. So how our audience is going to evaluate it based upon uh, like our own uh, representation and demonstration of values. Um, the audience is of importance or most important to this type of speech. They require special consideration. It's much like that pay forward idea or any type of pre planning that goes into place. That's exactly what the concept of the universal audience is. Everything takes place during the writing process. Uh, because the, the red or and the audience are going to argue potentially over these issues of value, it has to take serious contemplation, serious uh, uh, consideration of that for buying. So, what in uh, Medeb Albright's Tenaka are suggesting is that no claim or any conclusion that you're going to make can be self-evidently true. There's very few things that without having some kind of evidence or some kind of backup can be absolutely true. We, and in argument, we can't go and he suggests you can't use things like absolutes, like what did we talk about before? Do you remember when he was talking about absolutes? I need a way to argue about values without having it come from a space of. So let's go back to this idea of abortion. Every time that somebody's bringing up abortion, they want like Planned Parenthood or let's say conservative individuals on the topic of abortion do not want Planned Parenthood to go on because of why. Planned Parenthood offers, and typically individuals who are conservative or against abortion because why? They believe in A? Right. So like the, the life is the most important, this baby's life, conception, etc. right? Where did they get that ID? Go with it. What's screaming from the rooftop? Absolutely. Is the premise or is the grounds for the belief system about abortion more than likely taken from a perspective of a religious standpoint? Yes, and that's what he's saying. He's like, abortion shouldn't be argued about from a purpose of God. Why? Because that, because that's going to be correct for who? The individual. The individual. But how can we apply that to what? Can we still argue about abortion from a value standpoint without bringing in religion or some kind of, um, or a commonly held belief that was constructed through some kind of terrible government oppression or perchance through this idea of science? Like we can't argue around those particular things. So then how do we start to argue about it? Does that make sense, Camille? Then how do we even start to argue about it? So even formal, oh hi! Oh my gosh, y'all, it is like social day! Why did you give me the Then he, yeah, and then he, he also goes to like a two or three class, which I'm always very impressed with. All right, that said, uh, so what? Isn't that crazy?
crazy how time flies. Like You're like, what's the best of all time? I know. I saw a student in the hall the other day. I was like, oh, come on. Anyway, so only what he is suggesting through a continuous public dialogue about particular values is the way that any type of policy or any type of new law can actually be decided upon and established as being reasonable. It needs to be taken to the public. It needs to be tested out in the world. And it needs to be taken to the audience to see how they would respond to this idea. But it has to be done in a way that is fine and it's ethical, that it's logical. It isn't just getting people to get on board, a la the Scottness, right? For the purpose of socialism. They're, all, they're very particular about this group, and that's the audience, and their emphasis for their entire argument, whether it be universal audience or starting point or presence, is all about that audience. Two questions. Are you working with someone who's public all the part, or do you have like a go-to person that you say? I mean, 90% Perlman, 10% You can simply refute Kurt of Perlman, I'm fine with that. It is hard because, again, nobody likes to give a lot of credit to the supporter. She gives credit to her organization. They worked together for like 20 years, but it's hard for me to find a lot of mention of her or what she came in or what she actually contributed to the discourse. Um, that could be something that you could think about and talk with her as well, but also if for the purpose of this piece or for the purpose of writing it, you could simply refer the argument and your audience, so like I said, the emphasis is going to be on the audience, and all argumentation aims at gaining adherence from the group. Mm -hmm. From the audience, but not just from any old audience. It wants to gain adherence, much like the idea of Plato. And if you recall back to Plato, he was, or sorry, Sophus, in, like with Gorgias, he wanted people to submit to him without having to like work for it. That the rhetoric would make them submit all on their own. And that's the same-ish idea that goes along with Perlman, that he wants to gain adherence in the minds of the audience through intellect, through logic, and you know, essentially this intellectual contact that we can have with, with each other. Let's stimulate each other's minds. And so the it, argument and the audience become intertwined. You would never write anything without taking into consideration the audience because the only way that you're going to get something passed or you have a policy passed or you have a new law or you get people to vote for you is for them to feel this kind of stimulation, but also to be able to decipher whether or not your argument was successful. And so you have to take that into consideration. People sit and just think about their own work in their own times. And remember, if this is going on during like the time of World War II, it's like, nobody's going to be taking really into consideration. The audience, absolutely. Because what are they concerned about? They're concerned about their own selves and getting their own agendas met and you know, is this best for the audience, is it not? Although he wants to appeal to you intellectually, and he wants the arguments to follow some kind of flow that makes sense, logic in the traditional sense is not as important. You don't need to see a syllogism or an empathy. Well, of course, they are effective. But the audience is going to determine to great extent what steps that argument takes. Because depending upon who I am speaking to, you're, you may never feel like a syllogism is the right way to go. To present you with some type of like causal reasoning or anecdotal reasoning or just straight induction may not be the best way to appeal to you. So the audience is going to determine the steps that I take in creating that argument. And the thing about Perlman as well as Weaver, it's like people always want to say, well, then here's exactly how you do it. But you know, from writing a paper, there's a good structure. Every single person has a different way to write a thesis or to where to put it in a paper. And the same thing goes with writing an argument. That at this point, arguments don't take that same rigid standpoint as they used to. 
which we can see in the many different devices that are used in rhetoric today or in advertisement, they are still grounded in some kind of logical form that we learn about, but it's not existent within this very rigid box that we've described earlier. So the audience's role in this process is not only to determine the worth of that argument, but in, but in addition to, they are also there to test your argument. So what do I mean by test your argument? So we said we want to put it out to the masses and we want to make the ideas come to life, and that they should be tested and that, the, uh, that we should put out our discourse and we should put out our ideas to the audience, but what does it then mean that they are going to be testing our ideas. Are we going to be doing a bunch of focus groups? Is that what Perlman was doing in the 1980s? No. Where does this testing take place? In the public sphere? According to his concept known as the, the testing takes place where? No matter how I go around it, every 
create way, 18 ways this person is what? Not going to. She's not going to change. She's not going to conform. Do you ever have those people that you argue with that you're like, well, why do I even bother anymore? This usually takes years to understand. It's like I can continue to give you a suggestion and give you a suggestion and give you a suggestion. The 17th time they come to you and complain, you're like, are you effing kidding me? Stop complaining. If you're not going to do something about it, then stop. Like, I'm done now. This person may be a reason why. Like, why am I wasting my energy and time? I can spend this time on that. Those are your people. Huh? You do. And. And then we use the word compromise. Which, in the case of, like, back in the day, competence, like being an expert or being knowledgeable, or at least having some kind of wits about you, I guess, is really how we look at it. These days, if we had to have people who are being more competent, we probably wouldn't have people who are already doing that or permanently. Anyways, this is the largest possible audience that you can appeal to. It is the largest possible audience that has the, and this is a key, largest possible that has the potential to hear your. is my audience that can quite possibly articulate what you're worried about? This is the universal audience. Are they real? Okay. So where did this universal audience exist? In the mind of the who? Oh, good job, everybody. The speaker imagined. Absolutely. They, as, as Perlman would say, the universal audience is a mental construct. So let me put it in terms. If you're getting ready to deliver a speech at LMU graduation, you are the student speech delivery. The universal, when you start to write, you write with the universal audience in mind because you know that this is the most effective way for you to do what? Reach the largest amount of people possible and do it in the most mindful and ethic, ethical, ethical good way possible. So that is our first step to start saying, okay, well, what's my universal audience? Well, it's all reasonable and all, pretty much all of humanity, right? The potential of, so it could be all of humanity. The largest possible potential to hear your message, and it's a mental construct. So who would you start putting with this idea of the universal audience? Well, the universal audience is made up of three other small audiences, and this is an easy way to start to understand. The text that you're given, now talk to me about how you saw the universal audience in the particular audience. particular audience is made up of universal audience? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that's why I'm saying, like, if you think of it in, like, the forms of you can have the, there's going to be these others that we talked about. There's the particular audience, and then there's the audience of one, and there's the audience of self. So these are the three audiences, and I, I do it in this way because it makes more sense to me, um, that will, so, like, that will make up for the purpose of looking at our, let's look at the second page with this Megan Kelly and the Fox News. This was during debate number one when people were still trying to figure out who they even wanted to be their Republican. Megyn Kelly of Fox News says, Mr. Trump, one of the things people love about you is you speak your mind and you don't use a politician's filter. However, that is not without its downsides, in particular when it comes to women. You call women you don't like fat pigs, dogs, 
swabs and is testing animal. Your Twitter account, and he's perks in, he says, only Rosie O'Donnell. And then people laugh. Why is it not okay to laugh at that? Right? And people are like, ha ha ha, let me get on board. And then when you laugh, that is exactly what Plato's talking about with the injustice, right? The injustice suggests that it's okay to laugh. That perpetuates a society, it creates a standard, and that continues to pollute not only the individual, but also the society of all. It's the same idea with that tweet that was on your, on your thing. Do you recall? You put out a tweet from an unknowledgeable perspective about something that could be very dangerous to society, and it becomes very problematic. Same idea. Anyway. Your Twitter account has several disparaging, uh, disparaging comments about women's looks. You once told a contestant that it would be a pretty picture to see her on her knees. Does that sound like the temperament of a man we should elect as president? Is the question. And how do you answer the charge from Hillary Clinton, who is likely to be the Democratic nominee, that you are part of the war on women? And his response is, the big problem with this country has is being I've been challenged by so many people, and I don't frankly have time for political correctness. And to be honest with you, this country doesn't have time either. This country is in big trouble. We don't win anymore. We lose to China, we lose to Mexico, both in trade and at the border. We lose to everybody. Frankly, what I say, and oftentimes is fun, is kidding. We have a good time. That's what somebody said as I walked by, and they like smacked me on the ass in college, sent me on my way. I was hot. And just kidding. So he said, okay, so. Nobody! Okay, good. As long as we're getting that. It's not okay to just be kidding, right? It's almost like making a racial joke. I said the N-word. I was just kidding. And honestly, Megan, if you don't like it, I'm sorry. I've been very nice to you, although I could probably not be based on the way that you have treated me, but I wouldn't do that. You're so nice. But you know what? We need strength. We need energy. We need quickness. And we need brain in this country to turn it around. I can tell you that right now. So did he answer the question? No. Okay. So the issue here is let's make this our example of what we want to do in regards to how to appeal to specific things like the universal audience. So if you were going to speak, knowing about the universal audience, all of humanity is the possibility of listening, and we have the potential to get the largest people amount of people to agree with you. So the idea of writing to a universal audience would instead not be to pinpoint specific what? Groups, individuals, okay? But also, he's very specific about his ideology for the person, correct? That we need to let go of what? Political correctness. Do you all know what people mean when they say political correct? It's kind of like a definite end. Like one time in my article, girl, in communication class, I was telling this story. I said, I'm so over the political right. Everybody, I'm so over political correctness. I'm so over political It's where we make comments about marginalized groups that are despairing or that are harmful or that will continue to put them down. That's all it is. It's me making fun of somebody who's disabled. But when somebody goes, hey, don't do that, I go, oh, stop being so politically correct. It's political correct, right? Well, we can have fun. Does that make sense? So political correctness isn't, because I think that, well, we can talk about that one. Particular audience is the next group that we can look at here. And this is one of the audiences that he suggests we start to look at in advance. Who is the particular audience, does he suggest? Now we can get out of our head. The particular audience is the actual audience of whom is going to be what? 
who we are talking to. So if you are interested in studying marketing or advertising or public relations, that's why I always say that film is a good one. Your particular audience is essentially like your target audience. That's how we look at it. Do you remember like a target audience and stuff? Because our target audience is who we actually want to target, who are the people that we can get or who are um, coming so, for example, before school starts, I get a list of who you are and all your criteria and what year you are and what your major is and where you live, all that kind of good stuff. And at Santa Monica, I get all their test scores, and I have to know, or they give me all this while. I, so that I hope to know who my audience is, so that I can start to make specific assignments that are revolved around their level of competence. So that I can appeal to them if I know that like this is my particular age group. Now I can start to make examples of specific stories that are what? Relevant to? Yeah. Absolutely, relevant to the audience and relevant to them. So these are the ways that we do things. Okay, good. So what else, what are the other qualities of a particular audience? These are people who are, they can be reasonable. And they can be competent, but they don't have to be, right? Because are you going to find irrational, unreasonable, uncompetent people in your regular audience, in your the audience that's in front of you? Yes, yes, we have to think about that, like logically. Of course we're going to find those individuals. But the audience that the writer is most specifically addressing, and it's generally, generally, not always, but it's generally the audience that is going to be physically present. When he wrote that, mass media communication wasn't as predominant as it is today. We know that so much more discourse and public discourse takes place outside of the sphere of, sphere of in-person speeches, right? I never watch a debate, a debate live. I almost always will read it, and then I'll go back and watch particular parts of it. Um, but I almost always read it instead. Um, so I think I talked to you about a target audience before when I talked about my mom. My, the person that they always want to get on the phone to make their argument. Okay. So let's talk about a particular audience. For example, um, so if any, how many of you are studying like marketing or advertising or something like that? Let's go. Yay. Okay, fantastic. So you have a new product out on the scene. Or, oh, so, for example, all of us are going to be coming up with a new laundry detergent for Target. Who is your particular audience? Those people who go and shop at Target. And the people who actually come to the stores or who do shop online. And who are going to Target for the purpose of even in this case, laundry detergent, right? That is going to be our particular audience. So just like any great marketing person or advertising person or PR person, there are typically a standard set of evaluative criteria that you go through. So for example, if we wanted to market our new laundry detergent on TV, we have to start critically thinking about so whom are we going to appeal to? So for example, if you are home during the afternoon and you turn on the television, what types of commercials are you going to see? Usually like three different types of commercials in the afternoon. You're watching your favorite soap. You're watching Judge Judy. Yeah. Fantastic! Absolutely. So some type of trade or technical school or online college. Why? If you're home during the day, ah, and you probably need a, ah, maybe you need a job. Okay, good. They know that this is part of their what? Audience. Okay, good. What other types of commercials are you going to see? Household stuff, cleaning supplies, household stuff, things to make life easier. So for whoever is home during the day and you know maintaining a home. That's part of it. Who else? There's one more. And it's always like, oh. Old people. Good. I mean, most of the time, yeah, because it is like a retiree situation. 
but it starts to lock and it enters the foyer to the next room. There's so many lock merchants there today. Why? Because people have been injured on the job and they're there for their disability. These are the commercials that you see during the day. So how do they find out that these are the three commercials that you're going to love? Survey. So we start to find out who's home during the day, who's going, who's not there. Maybe we do it through a survey or something. But what they do is they find out about these individuals. They find out about the particular demographic. It's why if you turn on Saturday morning cartoons, what types of commercials are you going to see? You're not going to see lawyers. You're not going to see online to grade college. It's toys. You're going to see toys and cereal and foods and different things that appeal to a child, right? And they're going to be able to make those messages depending upon the particular show that you're watching. What age group is it? So now how can we start to build our commercial? What uh, maybe, so what are demographic criteria? Age, gender, sexual orientation, religion, economic standpoint, all of these different demographic factors or things to take into consideration or criteria to take into consideration when building our particular audience. So in the case of Target, who's shopping at Target and why? Who usually shops at Target? Um, okay, maybe moms. Do you still shop at Target? Are you moms? Okay, then now who's, so who shops at Target? Not just moms. College students. Well, college students, okay, and moms. Who else shops at Target? A lot of people, that's for darn sure. But typically, these people want what? Why do you go to Target? You get everything. You get a one-stop <laughs> shop. I don't have to take multiple trips. It used to be rather reasonable, if you will. Their, their prices were more competitive. They also have their own brand, which can be what? Cheaper. Mm -hmm. And they try to produce and promote those brands quite often. So if we start to look at like those particulars about that audience, we can start to gather some of our resources in order to make our argument the most effective that it can be. Your particular audience is going to reveal to you their values. So the values of a particular audience will come in here. And you can start to examine some of those. Um, but also, of your particular audience will come into play. Um, so for example, even though, so who is this speech appealing to? Who is this particular audience? So, okay, they're American, but it's smaller. Because this is the Republican National Convention, so this gets a little bit specific. Who is the particular audience that is in the audience? Okay, so we see that these individuals now are Republicans, right? And so, knowing that these individuals are Republicans, what else is he telling us about? How else can we determine what this particular audience is? Who else is in this audience that you thought that Donald Socially and personal. What can we do? Yeah? Who is going to be the target of the U.S. Okay, good. So clearly it's like people who are over politicians. I mean, Donald Trump would, but would the average person say something like this if they didn't know their audience was already in agreement? So tell me then, what does this audience then, what does it suggest this audience already values, or for lack of a better word, doesn't value? Well, okay, so they, 
don't value yeah. political correctness. So in that case, then making comments that are disparaging against who? Minorities for this group is what? Okay, and he tested it, maybe beforehand in his mind, but he also tested it out loud and people what? They laughed. Ah, so he got that agreement. So he can continue to perpetuate that, right? So knowing that about this audience makes it so much easier to deliver to it in that way. So we can definitely start to make arguments based upon our particular audience. And people do this all the time. That idea of pandering. I know what you want to hear, so I'm going to play to it. I know what your wants and your desires are, so I'm going to build that in. I know that you're staying home during the day, so I'm going to create this new thing that you have to do blank in order to be a good mom or a good woman or a good housekeeper, right? We build these ideas in. So it can be done in, in many different ways with this rhetoric. In turn, you then have to go, I really want to say this one to your values, your beliefs, Every social circle has its own opinions and beliefs, so if you've got a specific how oh yeah, so that's good too. So then we, every single message that you have, so for example, and this is an important thing about the universal audience, is that if you had a speech and that you would go out and use in different places, so for example, like Christo, who has this show, like That's So Gay to Play, right? He takes it to numerous different places, and it's all college campuses. But if he was going to go outside of the college campus, now what does he have to start to do in order to curtail to his particular audience? He needs to find out to whom he is speaking well in advance. So just like the same thing. So let's say I'm like the utmost and foremost person on speaking about, yay, pro-choice. I can't wait. I'm super pro-choice. And then I am asked to come and speak at a dinner for 45 to 65-year-olds who are Republican conservative Catholics. Do I get that same exact speech? No. So you constantly have to do what? Right, and so in this case, now we have to start shifting our dialogue. We have to start switching our arguments. We can still get the same goal accomplished. I can still communicate the need to have a pro-choice uh, existence in our society, but I can do it in a way that is going to appeal to that particular audience so that they can come to see my side of the story, so that they can come to understand the perspective that I am speaking to without simply becoming unreasonable and shutting down. It is the job of the who, in that case, the red orb, to start to move you half west if we're going to make things happen. Okay. So um, it's important simply to understand these views that these individuals have and how they play such an important role in constructing an argument and getting your point across. The next one is the audience of one. So who's the audience of one? Technically, it's referred to, in, in the easiest of terms, it's your opposition. We have to consider this also as we start to write. Because if any of you have ever written an argumentative essay, do you just write about your own perspective? No, who do you start to write to? Opposition. The opposition. You have to bring up any type of well thought out argument. It's already addressed, right? That's what a dialectic is. In essence, we have two contrasting arguments so that we can anticipate what is our opposition going to say and we can protect ourselves about it before we ever even get into the realm. So when Hillary Clinton has been preparing for five you know, days before this last election, she's practicing questions that would counter her so that she can prepare to know how to answer them. Same thing happens in debate. You would always prepare from the other side. The same thing happens with lawyers, and I think we've spoken about this a bit before. If they go on a case and you answer one question that, like let's say you ask a question they answer this way, then you go along this line of reasoning. If they answer the question this way, then they start to ask a different question. So my mom, I think I told you, like back when George Bush was running for president, the people used to call the house all the time. Did I tell you that? Oh my gosh. So my mom, like when George Bush was running for a second term, my parents, uh, who were Republicans, and then they switched to being Democrats, which is a sign of being Republican. But my parents were Republicans in the first, and then they switched it out to the Democratic George Bush term. And so my parents were always like those people who get the calls because they were donating money at the time, and they were like, hey, y'all, I used to speak with Judy, and I was at their house, I was like, absolutely, so I took the, they were like, it's the Republican Act, the Republican Party coming in, like, yes. And I'm always known, because the question is, do we have your support to vote for George Bush in the next election? And if you could only hear my mom, it's like, 
So does that person just hang up and be like, okay, no, because they know how to write an effective argument, and they know that this person is either on the fence or the opposition is going to be weak in understanding and starting to create an argument. Because any, like if we said, like if we broke up the room, you three over there, like I'm running for teacher of the year and I'm really excited about it. And you three over there are like, Amanda, we love you. You're so excited. Teacher of the year and you make posters. Thanks, y'all. And then this group right here is like, Meh, I don't know, kind of curious still out. And then you three are like, So you're all my particular audience in essence. I know who my favorites are. I'm just kidding. And I can appeal to them. But the audience of one is you all right here, as well as you all right here. Because just like my mom, do, 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 do. so when they're like, can we? And she's like, no, 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 to leave it to us. Let's just all see what you want anymore. And I don't understand why we have education. I don't know why are we still at this war, blah, blah, blah. So this intern, whoever's doing this, does not put down the phone and like start texting. But what they do is they start writing what? Concerns. All of my mom's what? Concerns. Concerns. That next time George Bush comes to California and talks to women who are in their 50s to 60 years old who are on the fence, George Bush can say, one of the reasons as to why some of you may not be on my side or want to vote for me is because you don't understand my platform against women. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to clear that up. Let me tell you exactly what I'm going to do. So that it allows you an opportunity to know what their argument is, or why they are against you, or why they're on the fence. And if you can bring that to light, and you can show them that you are on their side, or show them and make them uh, start to agree and uh, align their ideals with you, then we're more likely to gain your adherence. So it is an essential component as to understanding why. So it's like the, going back to that idea of I speaking to women about abortion who are like within that age range. It's like, where did they come up with this idea? What was their value system? Where did they grow up? What is their reasoning behind why they disagree with abortion? If I know that it's primarily because of a religious purpose, then then there I need to like then go forth to talk about that, but in a rational way, right? So if, for example, I have all three of you, and then I get like this whole middle section, I don't really even need you three anymore. Like, let me just look at the numbers and say, eh, on their own. But the idea is that we want to reach the most people possible. And with this concept of the universal audience, now it allows me to really start to do so. The last thing that we'll look at here is the audience of self. This is you. This takes place nowhere else. This is the part where you can come to bring about this idea of a moral compass. So when we are arguing about or with the audience of self, I always like to picture it in my own head as being like me in a dark room, all alone, writing. The idea is that like you can't bullshit yourself. Have you ever heard this? Like I'm totally going to put on these workout clothes because I'm going to work out later. Well, it's where these clothes always are. I'm going to have a slice of pizza and then start arguing with my pizza. I'll work out later. I'll do it. But like, am I going to do it? If I know I'm not going to do it, then I probably wouldn't go through with it, right? But we do this all the time with ourselves. This idea is that if you're sitting in a dark room and you're suggesting that you are going to do something, then you better be able to do it. Wouldn't it be insane if every single president, elect, what? candidate, followed the audience of self? Like spoke to the audience of self? Wouldn't that be amazing? Is it just me? Why do you not think it's amazing? You. You. Like you, you were going through your own opinions. Uh, it's not even you versus your own opinions. It's literally you going through and being like, I'm going to be selling this detergent, and I'm going to put on that detergent, gets all stains out. And I'm writing that advertisement, and you're like, that's going to do it. People will love it. They'll be like, oh, yes, finally. If it can't get all stains out, should I put that on there? No. And that is how we start to just check ourselves before we wreck ourselves is really the way that we do it. You can't BS yourself. So if there is a lie, if there is an untruth, if it 
there is something that you can't follow through on, if there is a promise that you are making that cannot be connected, do not include it and take it out now. Because that is going to encourage your audience to see these kinds of like, not only being practical, but also it's going to, that is the way that you can keep yourself mindful, that you can keep yourself ethical. Is what I'm saying true and honest? If it isn't, cross it out. Is this the best for my audience? If it's not, cross it out. Can I come through and follow through? So now when I clarify it, do you think it would be nice if the presidential candidate could do that? Yeah, it would be nice if everybody did that. Then we wouldn't have to think of rhetoric as being something so what? Manipulative. Instead, we could see it as something that's just a vehicle for persuasion in a way to get you to understand or see things differently. Okay. Make sense now? So what he suggests is that when you write, you write to this concept of the universal audience. And once you test with the particular and the one and the self, then you are ready to put your work out to the masses and out to the public. Does that make sense? Then we're ready to take this speech to the press. Then we're ready to release the campaign. Now I'm ready to click enter on the tweet that I just wrote. Now I'm ready to answer my question to a forum so that I ensure that I can reach the largest group possible and do it in a mindful and ethical way. Do each of you see how you could do this one right? Like if I gave you a, a um, if I give you a product right now, and I said, okay, let's go for it, let's write to it, could you see how that would work? If I said, you need to sell this to water bottle users who are only using, like, we're going to sell this at, as the new, the replacement glass bottle. It's called Nathan, the replacement glass. Okay, I know. I should apply that to the universal audience. Now I'm going to take it, and I'm going to start to write to my particular audience. To whom am I going to be writing? Go ahead. Okay, hold on. Let's clarify. Oh, it just says the glass. Do you start with the self or the replacement glass? Doesn't matter. Or do you kind of just spell my opening say yes? I, I wouldn't say that. No, I, I'm a liar. Never mind. Do the self glass. Self glass? Well, I would. I would always. <laughs> literally lays out a plan. I do it like this every time, particular one stuff, because I know who I already like, and I know what I'm aligned with, and I know where I want to go, and I know who my target audience is, and they're the easy ones to write to. And then I write to the opposition. It's almost, almost like writing a paper. You write out your own opinion, you address the opposition, and then you bring it home. So if it's for you next, this is the last one. So you really bet. Check yourself before you go, because how can I check that I've said something mindful? I haven't written it yet, is really how I think. You can, if you are a very good writer, do them all at the same time. You may need to go through it a couple times, but you could probably do some kind of self-editing as you're writing, which I think that most of us would. We would also, if you were giving an answer in a debate, and we said something that we realized was a promise, or I said always, or all, all, all the time, or every single person, as a competent person, and a person in power, I would know that I should probably replace that word with my next word and see what the whole thing is and put it over with what I can and can't get wrong. Sure. Yeah. Let's go into that. Does anybody else need this? Any other questions before we go on to like starting point? I want that person to me. So again, if I have this bottle and I want to take it out to the masses of like plastics or whatever, what time is it? So my particular audience is who? People who are looking for water bottles. Great. So this could be a lot of different people, but I want to sell it at already audiences. Now I know that they are active people. So I can call out REI and be like, hey REI, what's your best like what's your typical patron? What are you paying for water bottles? Do I have to get through them or raffle through? Are you more women or more men? Who knows? We could just like set up something to start to figure out how to appeal to them. Then we go back on those big generalizations. This age group enjoy people who are women sometimes do, but we want don't want to make those stereotypes. So then, yes, generalization is good. Fantastic. Then we go to the audience of one, and this would be our opposition. So people who would not use plastic bottles are people who are with what? Who would use metal or aluminum or glass, right? Who think that plastic is 
bad or problematic or going to like give you the hormones? So how would we appeal to them? Maybe by making a comparison to things like maybe taste of the water or talking about this plastic as in it's a new type of plastic that doesn't have, because they like to do that, it's what free? BPA free, so it's fine. And they're like, okay, right? So, so we can start to appeal to them that in that way. Then the audience itself, if we go through this advertisement or the promotion or the commercial that we're making, we need to make sure that what we're saying is true, that it will come through, that it will not give you the pesticides, that it is excellent for hiking, that that little strap is going to be the thing that will save you on a, I don't know, on a long trip if you attach it to your belt, whatever. But making sure that it's clear and obvious. Does this make sense? Yeah, you can use any part of it. Clearly, this person did not address the audience of one. There's a ton of college students who are like, what? I would never do that. And there's another group of college students who are like, yeah. So like, those people were like, I would never do that. This is how you can appeal to them. This is a better way. So you can even address their concerns. You can address their reasoning and to then bring up the points that we're making. So if you wanted to, you could talk about the universal audience as a whole and break down the three parts. Those would be your main points. Or you could just use one of the particular. very hard to understand starting points. I don't know if that's the same for both of you. And if you tried to read it six times and were like, I still don't get it, and then you went to Google and you tried Googling it and you still didn't get it, it's a little bit painful. It's a little bit painful. I don't feel like anybody really did Google it. I feel like I did. But anyway, a new rhetoric, the book that Perlman and Albrecht this detective came up with, um, developed new ideas concerning the future of rhetoric, which we know. And the new ideas were to have a couple different things. So when we're writing the argument, this is like the concept or whatever. Now we're getting into like actual arguments and starting. So the new ideas were to have starting points for making. Have you ever had a disagreement with someone? Have you ever tried to have a civil argument with somebody where two sides existed and you were never able to get to a conclusion or a result? That's where starting points come in. Because the biggest mistake that individuals will make when writing is not starting at a place of agreement. If you start with a disagreement, the arguments are much present an argument to an audience to have a place that we start at that we both agree on and then we can take off from there is a great great process. Perlman really writes a lot in the deductive style meaning a lot of specific instances to draw us to a, a, a conclusion that we can generally agree He also wanted us to have a new idea on methods or ways something is usually done for governing, governing arguments and practices, and then finally, give us some mechanisms for making specific conclusions. I'm going to have us concentrate really on this number one, and that's the starting points for making an argument. So ideally, with rhetoric and the starting points, an argument success is dependent upon starting with the arguable arguer belief that the audience will accept. So what do I know about my audience? Again, to whom am I? Yeah.
Yes. So we would want to keep that in mind. To whom are, good, good question. To whom are we speaking? So if I know that I can start with something that you are going to accept, that's where we can, we can go for. The audience is more likely to accept this message, as Perlman suggests, it is in, it in terms of an audience that is argumentation is developed, which we spoke about in part four. So how that looks, because your question of Putnam was there, I will talk about the starting point Arguments, presence is a tool. It's much like Eco's pathos bones. So it is a, a little tool to put inside of an argument, or to, it's essentially like choosing a word, or choosing a phrase, or choosing a gesture that's going to assist in your audience seeing something that either one, they didn't know, or two, has been hidden and they want to bring up in order to make light of it and in order to make it stand out. Presence typically appeals to your senses. So if you see advertisements for some kind of food or some kind of product, you're you, like especially with food, you're going to see how they're going to make specific rhetorical strategies that are going to be derived around your senses, depending on like, what they want to be known to. For example, with this laundry detergent, if my big thing was that it was going to be like environmentally friendly, because I was going to be selling it in an environmentally friendly place, or for example, you know when everybody got on the environmental binge a couple, like, I don't know, like seven, eight years ago or so, and the word that you see on every single product is what? Green. Green, right? Have you noticed that? What does green mean? But when you see it, you're like, ooh, that's something what? Good. Good. So they highlight it and they make it stand out so that that's what you're drawn to over anything else. It's like, oh, well, that one's green. It's probably, it's like when I get, get guilty and I'm just like, oh, here. Right? So they bring these ideas up. So through presence, we can establish what is, in fact, real. We can establish their truths and their facts if they haven't been established. But it's typically done through style and delivery and disposition if we're thinking about public oratory. Because this is the most important part. And now what do I make clear? But I also can make it clear through things like the 16% of people who are not recycling. And now what have I done to my tone? I have told you what? You're not recycling. Right? So that is how like that idea of presence can be established. Um, so you can either make something absent present to the audience, or you can increase the presence of something that has already been brought to the audience's attention. If you want to look at the example, and the perfect example of this presence is in the last page, and it's when Donald Trump is talking about abortion, and everybody's going through this abortion idea, but he continues to bring up, he says, but it's okay with, but it's not okay with, okay, now you can say that's okay, and Hillary can say that's okay, but it's not okay with me based on what, he's, what she's saying, and based on where she's going, and based upon where she's been. You can't take the baby and rip the baby out of the womb in the ninth month on the final day. That's not acceptable. He then goes back to repeat it again. You can't take a baby out. You can't take a baby. You can't rip a baby out two or three days prior to birth. Nobody has that right. When we talk, the whole thing is about third trimester abortions. So if an audience did not know about a third trimester abortion and people were talking about it in a practical way, what did he make very clear? It was something that was absent from the content to begin with. Everybody's talking about third term abortion, but nobody's talking about what? The process of it. Ripping a baby out of a mom and killing it for the freedom. By the way, they're supposed to all not have the So, um, or increase the presence of something that has already been brought to the audience's attention. This would be where he always likes to remind you about like the problems of like building a community. Right? He's, and people are like, 
got it through the story, or like we know the information from the story, etc. But he's going to keep bringing it up because he wants you to concentrate on what? That instead of something else. Oftentimes, if presence is done in an illogical and ill-minded way, it's called a fuh, fuh, fuh fallacy. It's essentially a red herring. However, if it's based upon fact or truth, which Perlman would want you to do, it's something a bit different. So if you're looking at an advertisement and you see that one um, word is highlighted over another, you probably know that's like a presence thing or like um, like their body is like in a specific way so that they want you to concentrate like on something. They're trying to sell you that rather than sell you something else. So this is a way that we can use it. Uh, uh, and, and then again, it can come through the use of repetition. It can come through the use of, of language or style or gestures that depending upon the median, it can certainly be used in different ways, but hopefully you understand that it's something that's brought to our attention that wasn't there or something that we really want to focus on. Does that make sense? Okay. Do you all think that you could potentially go home and write your whatnot? Yeah. We all have choices during Halloween. <laughs> we have choices about our costumes. We have choices about how to talk to other people who are wearing costumes. We have choices about what to do. I just want to remind you that nobody, that like, we just want to respect other people and be like, good for you, not for me. Yes. Yeah, good. No need to hate. I hope that you don't, Katie. Go to the cross. Good job, Lori. Can I ask you a question? Oh, it's Nancy. Can you walk?